Hello and welcome to Philosophy Gets Schooled. I'm Simon Kirchin, a philosopher based at the University of Kent. We're recording this episode in November 2023. This episode is about philosophy of the mind and in particular physicalism and in particular two um, areas of physicalism, two positions, mind-brain type identity theory and eliminative materialism. So we'll be thinking about what physicalism is in general, we think about mind-brain type identity theory and eliminative materialism and the issues that arise with both. And we'll also see what else we get on to as always. Joining me in this episode we have Michael Lacewing who teaches philosophy at Christ's Hospital School. Hi Michael. Hi Simon, thanks for having me again. Uh, and we've got Sally Latham, who teaches philosophy at Birmingham Metropolitan College. Hi, Sally. Hi, Simon. It's really nice to be here. And we have Adrian Samuel, who teaches philosophy and religious studies at Cheltenham College. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Simon. Good to be here. Great to have all three of you with us. OK, so we're going to be talking about a couple of significant positions within philosophy of mind. These positions, plus other positions in philosophy of mind, appear on the AQA a-level philosophy specification, which we're basing our discussion around. Uh, but if you're thinking about studying philosophy at university, no matter what you're doing, whether it's A-level or IB or hires, it's worth listening to. Um, I'm running and organising a number of Philosophy of Mind podcast episodes at the moment, which uh, will be released in autumn 2023, not just on physicalism, but lots of other positions. So please check the others out too. Okay, so let's start with a general idea of philosophy of mind, which uh, on the AQA philosophy spec is normally called metaphysics of mind. And then we'll use that to lead us into physicalism. And then we'll go into mind brain type identity theory. So Adrian, do you want to start us off by getting us to think about philosophy of mind, please? Yeah, that'd be good. For me, the philosophy of mind is probably one of the most fascinating areas of philosophy, because in many ways, it's understanding, trying to understand itself. And the understanding, obviously, typically is understood as the mental, the mental trying to understand itself and whether it is actually a thing. And there are different ways of approaching this. We can probably see it through three lenses, as it were. There's the ontological question of what is real, what is the reality of the mental. There's the epistemological question of how do we know the mental then the normative question of what causal powers or explanatory powers does the mental have? And we can look at each one in turn. Turning first to the ontological question of the being or the reality of the mental, there are a number of options available to us. One is that the mental is something separate from the body, the physical body. In many ways, that's seen as a soul. So I've got two parts to me, as it were, the physical part and the mental part. And the mental part is a soul in some way inhabiting my body, which is typically characterized as Descartes' position, where he sees himself almost like a sailor in a ship, intermingled with that ship, perhaps, but nevertheless distinct from it. So that's one answer, which is substance dualism or mind-body dualism. And then the other options are pretty much physicalist options, where you say, no, no, that makes no sense. There are not two worlds, the mental world and the physical world, there is just the physical world. But there are different responses to that, where well, you've got the identity theory, uh, which we'll be discussing, of course, today, which is that the mental state is itself a physical state. And then you've got other approaches, which say, no, that's even property dualism is itself a form of physicalism, I think, rightly understood, because it says, okay, there is only one world, the physical world. But at the same time, it's got two sorts of properties and the mental properties in some sense float above the physical properties. Um, but you've got to see um, mental understandings through a different lens, as it were, um, than just physical explanations. So that's a, a variation on physicalism, a bit more complex, but nonetheless similar. Then you've got behaviorism, where the mental is physical behavior, and that's the best way to characterize it. And functionalism, whereby in many ways you see there's a physical input, a physical output, and the mental can be seen as a function that's interrelating those two. And then eliminative materialism or physicalism, which is what we'll also be discussing today, where in many ways you say that actually ment the mental is a confused way of understanding reality. In many ways, you've got to peel it away 
and look for more basic scientific accounts of what's happening so we don't con- get confused by what they call the folk psychology of mental talk. Um, so this is the first aspect, I think, in which we explore the philosophy of mind, the mental, under the ontological aspect, the question of what's real. But there's also the epistemological question of what's, how do we know the mental? Um, and then for someone like Descartes, which is the substance dualist model, we know the mental pretty much through introspection, through some sort of direct awareness, in many ways through our mind's eye. We don't use the physical eye, which we use for physical things, uh, the senses. We rather use the mind's eye, some sort of direct introspective awareness of our own thoughts. And that's the best way to know the mental. Whereas the physicalist positions we've discussed, they would disagree with that. They'd say, no, 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 there's not this sort of distinct way of knowing the mental. Um, We know things through our senses, through our physical way of understanding the world. And the mental itself has to be seen in the same way. We might be seduced by these intuitive concepts, but especially in the case of eliminative materialism, they are themselves delusional. They sort of confuse us and lead us to misunderstandings. We've got to almost sweep them away and stick to a rigorously physicalist epistemology, like an empiricist epistemology, where we look at what we can learn through our senses. And the final one is really this normative question of explanation and causation. For someone like the substance dualists, the explanation of the mental is quite distinct from physical causation. And in many ways, for someone like Descartes, it comes first. We need a rationalist model of explanation in terms of which we can understand and identify things properly and therefore trust what we learn through our senses. So explanation is more fundamental, the explanation of the mental. Whereas for the physicalists, no, 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 it's causation, physical causation that does the principal work. And what we've got to do is really analyze how these causal processes give rise to what we, what we think are these mental ideas, but really in some sense go behind them, go behind to the physical processes out of which they arise so that we can properly understand what we mean by the mental. And so those, I think, are the the three important aspects for trying to make sense of the mental, the ontological question of its reality, the epistemological question of how we come to know the mental, and the normative question of the explanatory or causal power of the mental. For example, can we actually change the world by our free will, by the decisions we make, or are the decisions we make simply the effects of causes, um, the physical causes that have shaped and created our character. And we'll obviously be going on now to explore, in particular, the physicalist models, um, trying to find out in particular about the identity theory and the eliminativist theories of mind. That's really, really helpful, Adrian. Thanks very much. Um, So we've got that big tour there of uh, philosophy of mind with all those positions and and questions and and ways of asking those those questions. And as Adrian's just said, we're now going to lead into mind-brain type identity theory. Uh, Michael, do you want to explain it for us in a bit more detail, please? Yeah, sure. So mind-brain type identity theory grew up alongside scientific developments about the role of the brain and the understanding of the brain, particularly in the 1950s and 60s. So a kind of couple of generations perhaps behind some of the, the, the main discoveries. And this often happens in philosophy of mind, that the, that the philosophy is inspired by and perhaps provides an explanatory framework for scientific discoveries. And as Adrian just explained, the, the main way that the physicalist wants to approach the question is with the view that there really is just one world, the physical world. And so it's, a, it's an old chestnut in in philosophy as to how the mind fits in to that physical world, because consciousness or thought don't obviously seem to be physical themselves. And so the the thought was with the discoveries in, in neuroscience that perhaps we can say that a thought or a, a state of consciousness, such as an emotion or a feeling of pleasure or a feeling of pain, simply are processes or states of the brain but simply thought of in a different way. 
And the model that's being used here is the model that was because is repeatedly used in one version of the, the history of science, that as science progresses, we kind of understand things a little bit more, things that we, we can identify in everyday life or in a kind of our, our normal ways of, of experiencing the world, we can unpack and understand what they really are. So JJC Smart, who is one of the people who proposed the mind-brain type identity theory in the 1950s, gives us an example of lightning. Well, we all know what lightning is from a, a common sense approach when we've seen it in the sky and so on. But what exactly is lightning? What, what kind of scientific account can we give of it? And we now know that it's um, a, a massive electrical discharge, that in fact, the, the energy and the type of, of, of event which lightning is, is very similar to current running through wires in your house and so on. And when you say that lightning is this massive electrical discharge from a cloud to the earth or between clouds and sheet lightning, that is there is meant to identify the the thing which lightning is. It's an identity claim that's going on there. Now, it might be that you can understand what lightning is. You kind of have the idea of lightning and you look over there and you go, oh, lightning. I wonder what that is. So you can understand the concept of lightning without knowing the answer to the question, what is lightning? Or another example that we could, um, that we could give is water. Now, people have known for thousands of years what water is through their everyday interactions with the world, but it wasn't until the, uh, the investigation of Lavoisier and, and others that kind of identified the molecular formula of water. And so if we say, well, water is H2O, we mean they are one and the same thing, just described slightly differently. And so somebody can have the concept of water without an understanding of molecular chemistry. Children, for example, until they're introduced to notions of hydrogen and oxygen and so on, they know what water is in the sense of they can think about things as water or juice or whatever it is. They have these different concepts of things to drink and so on, but they don't really understand the molecular chemistry. So the mind-brain type identity theory is making a similar kind of a claim when it says a thought is just an event in your brain, a physical event in your brain. So it's a, perhaps a, a, a network or a series of neurons which are connected together, firing. The idea of firing neurons firing is just this electrical impulse that passes through them. And similarly, we might want to say that consciousness has got something to do with the, the global setup of the brain or a conscious uh, event such as feeling pleasure or feeling sad are themselves also neurons firing. We could talk about having a belief as the way in which your, your neurons are connected. So it could be a kind of disposition of neurons to fire under certain kind of circumstances. So the way my neurons are connected up just is my belief, for example, that Paris is the capital of France, something along those lines. And the, the claim that Smart says is, look, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's what thought means. You can have the concept of thought and then be discussing as we are today, well, what is thought? What is consciousness? What is it for a thought to exist? Does it have to be part of a separate substance and so on? We all understand in some sense what we mean by thought and consciousness. But what I'm claiming, says Smart, is that what the answer, the correct answer to the question, what is a thought or what is consciousness, is some particular activity or structure of the brain. So this is called an ontological identity or an ontological reduction, not an analytic one. The claim that a thought is, is, a, is a set of neurons firing or something along those lines is not a definition in the sense of the meaning of the word thought. It's a definition in the sense of what a thought actually is. A bit like you know, a child can have an understanding of the meaning of the word water without understanding that water is H2O. So this kind of really answers the question, where does the mind fit into the physical world? It turns out it's simply a part of it. Namely, it is the operations of a human brain, or perhaps other similar brains. We'll get into that issue, no doubt, in shortly. But that is what the mind is. It is simply no more than your brain doing its thing. That's it. That's what the mind is. Great. Thanks, Michael. Really good and helpful explanation. Right. So there are some problems with mind brain type identity theory. And there's a, there's a two or three mentioned on the specification. And one of them that looms large is multiple realizability. 
Sally, time for you to come in and explain multiple realisability for us. Sure. So if you have already listened to the behaviorism um, podcast, you'll know that multiple realizability was a problem for the for the behaviorist. It's also a problem for the identity theorist. So if you look at what is being claimed here, we're claiming that pain, for example, is brain state X. So this type of uh, this type of uh, mental state is a type of brain state. And that's fine. But we're saying that then you know, pain has these particular properties. But we know empirically that the same mental state can be manifested in lots of different brain states. So, for example, if I was in pain and my cat was in pain, then no one would deny that we've got the same mental state, but they will be different brain states. They have to be because we have different brain structures. So when we have now, it, it, there's a problem in saying that pain is brain state X when the cat's in pain and it cannot have brain state X. This multiple realizability also applies between human beings. So studies have shown that if you were to hook people up to brain scanners, show them the same visual image, different parts of the brain are sometimes activated. So, for example, in two different people, the experience of seeing a a green tree could be different brain states. So they've got the same mental state manifested in um, different brain states or or realized in, in different brain states. It's also conceivable that this could happen within the same person. So, for example, if I had the desire to visit Paris and then that is you know, a particular brain state, it's my P fibres in my brain. And then for some reason, I destroy those brain cells. I somehow I have an accident. I have too many vodkas. Those P fibres don't exist anymore. I can still have the desire to go to Paris. Another part of my brain's going to take that over. And studies about the plasticity of the brain show that that is something that happens. So we have this issue where it doesn't seem like we can make this claim to identity that the identity theorist wants to to make. Now, one potential solution to this is to look at a different form of identity theory called token identity. Um, And I'll do quite a very superficial explanation of that. It's a lot more complicated than I'm going to make it now. But a type can be thought of as a category. Okay, so pains, uh, fears, hopes. A token can be thought of as a particular instance of that category. So if I, took, for example, took the, the uh, category, the type chocolate bars, then you've got lots of different instances and different tokens of chocolate bars. You've got a Kit Kat, you've got a Chunky, you've got a Crunchy. And you know all of these things are different instances, different tokens of the same type, different instances of the same category. So if we change what we're claiming in terms of identity, Let's say that each individual token of a mental state is identical to a brain state. So we've got to maintain our identity or it's no longer identity theory, but we're being a lot more specific about it. So, for example, if I was to say, no, this pain is brain state X. So this token of pain of the type pain is brain state X. But that pain in the dog is brain state Y. And another pain in a different human being is brain state Z. And then my pain on a different day, because my brain's changed, could also then be a different brain state again. Now, in reality, there's probably going to be some strong similarities. We know that pains are associated with C fibers, but it does allow for that multiple realizability while still maintaining the identity. And it it ties in with empirical evidence as well. Now, a functionalist is going to tell you that this doesn't go far enough because we're still claiming that mental states have to be brain states of some sort. And a functionalist is going to say, well, why? You know, why can't we have mental states realized in non-biological systems? So they would say it's not it's not going far enough, but it does go some way to answering that problem. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Sally. Um, so also on the specification, we've got some uh, thoughts around dualism. Dualism always pops up. And the thought is that dualist arguments will be applied to mind brain type identity theory. So does someone want to uh, talk about uh, some of the dualist arguments, please? I could uh, I could take on um, problems with the physicist reductionism, perhaps, um, and then tie it back to dualism. I think the physicist reductionism often can be characterized like a layer cake um, where you've got all the sort of the cream and the froth at the top and you get down to the hard base at the bottom Um, and they can have a similar model of scientific explanation for example so let's say at the top you've got something like psychology 
the study of the mind, which is meant to be, in some sense, quite fluffy, not very rigorous science. And so you've got to, in some sense, reduce that explanation to more hard, factual basis. So maybe you reduce psychology to biology. And so, for example, you explain drives like sexual attraction in terms of something more biological, like the biological drive to reproduce. But then, of course, you still want greater physicist rigor in the program. So perhaps you say, well, okay, let's reduce biology to chemistry. And so, for example, I've got the DNA of my deoxyribonucleic acids, my genes wanting to reproduce, and somehow that, that demand for these chemicals to reproduce results in my biological drives. And these, But you still want to be even more rigorous in your scientific explanation. So you want to go behind even the chemistry of the, the, the DNA to the physics of the atomic weights of these different chemicals. So in many ways, you're sort of trying to go beyond less rigorous models of explanation to the most rigorous model of explanation. So you can basically explain psychology in terms of biology and biology in terms of chemistry and chemistry in terms of physics. And you therefore seem to get some almost foundationist view of reality, which doesn't depend upon subjective concepts which you associate with the mental, with psychology. But in many ways, I think this can be attacked as not only um, sort of problematic in itself, but even not true to the scientific method. Uh, someone like, for example, Professor Andrew Steen of Exeter College of the University of Oxford has argued that it isn't even true for the scientific method itself. Um, science involves a range of factors. It doesn't just record the physical facts, but it um, involves a certain creativity of generating hypotheses. Um, or an equation, for example, such as the principle of the conservation of momentum, where you've almost got to create concepts like mass and velocity and then put them together in an equation. And those equations are themselves structured in terms of basic principles, such as the principle of non-variance, that, that the laws are not going to vary as you move from different spot to different spot. So it seems like physics itself is quite a complex way of understanding the world. And we can't simply say it's recording the facts through a simple model of experimental observation. What's involved in physics is really quite a complex process of trying to make sense of the world. And so people like Professor Steen says, actually, we can't just reduce the, the psychological to the biological to the chemical and to the physical. There's rather a greater interplay between all different levels of explanation. And it's only through a more compre comprehensive explanation that we properly come to understand the world in which we live. And so if this is true, then many of the issues that dualism focuses on come back quite forcefully. For example, dualism says, well, the mental is intentional. Uh, we have descriptive mental states which are about something. Now, at the basic physical level, um, physical facts are not about anything. They are just facts. They are just themselves. Whereas the mental seems to have this intentional nature. Um, and it's difficult to say that we can just therefore reduce the mental as just a psychological phenomenon that can be reduced to Therefore, all these underlying levels, basically the physical. And similarly, the, the mental also has the characteristic of phenomenal awareness or qualia, the experience of what it's like to be something, to be read, for example. And again, you might want to try to reduce this down to basic physical facts or neurons firing or something that characterizes the brain. But if explanation is, involves a more complex model rather than just this foundationalist layer cake model in which you just go down to the base, it seems, again, many of the dualist concepts cannot just simply be explained away, but perhaps they play a much more fundamental role to explanation than a simple appeal to the basic physical facts that underlie anything allows us to really make sense of. And even things like evaluation. Um, can we say evaluation, let's say free will, which we typically ascribe to the mental, can simply be boiled down to, reduced to, the basic facts that are described by physics. And so we're left with many of the key concepts of dualism, such as the intentionality of the mental, the evaluation of the mental, 
and the qualia of the mental that might well have to be considered as much more fundamental to understanding than simply saying, no, no, these just belong to the psychological and they can be explained away in terms of these more basic physical explanations of physics because physics itself is a much more complex process than simply recording the facts as it's sometimes falsely claimed to be. That's great. Thanks very much, Adrian. Um, Sally, Michael, do you want to take on some of the other uh, thoughts associated with dualism? Sure. Um, So Descartes, in his defense of substance dualism, presents two arguments to, to in his meditations. And both of these can be reconstrued or re- restructured as objections to type identity claims. Um, so I'll, I'll just take the one, one of them now, which is the, the issue of divisibility. And he says, look, if we think about what we're thinking of in thinking of the mind, we think about it really clearly, we recognize that just as a matter of kind of conceptual truth, the mind is not something which could be chopped up. It doesn't have any spatial location, but physical things do. So quite literally, you can chop up my brain, but you cannot thereby quite literally chop up my mind and divide my mind into little pieces. And we could put this a a different way, which was kind of put as known as the location problem as well, is that mental states, even if you don't think there's a separate thing as a a mind, you might as well hold it as just going to what, what Ryle would call some kind of category mistakes, one sort of chronological error in saying that my pain is a particular set of neurons firing or my belief is a, is a particular structure within the brain because these, these parts of the brain have spatial location and they're spatially located to each other. And so you would end up being able to say that it was literally true that my belief that the Paris, that Paris is the capital of France is approximately two and a half inches further towards my forehead on the left hand side than the pain which is currently in my right toe. And as a sentence in English, one can really object that this is grammatically incorrect. You can't say beliefs are two and a half inches away from pains. I mean, this is just palpable nonsense. That would seems to be the, the kind of thing, way in which we can kind of press Descartes' um, view, that when we use mental terms, what we are talking about simply has no spatial location. But when we talk about the brain, parts of the brain and, and neurons firing, whether it's a, a simple part or whether it's even something as complex as a network of connections between the brain, that network nevertheless has a spatial shape. If you could draw out the network, then you would have what would look like a mess of string. But you, nevertheless, it would be spatially located. It would have a size and so on. But it simply makes no sense to attribute spatial properties to mental states. And so Descartes says, well, look, if it makes sense to attribute spatial properties to physical things, but it doesn't make sense to attribute spatial properties to mental things, they simply can't be one and the same thing. You could use something, use something if you want the technical kind of phrase in, in, in metaphysics. It's Leibniz's law of the indiscernibility of identicals. Really rolls off the tongue, that one. So the, the thought is that for, if two things really are just one thing, but described in two different ways, like lightning and, and electrical discharge or water and H2O, those supposed two things must share all their properties. If the water is in the glass, so is the H2O. And if the lightning you know, struck the field over there, then that's exactly where the electrical discharge struck it. They have to have all of their properties in common. But we've just demonstrated that mental things and physical things don't have a particular property in common. And that is that one is, one is spatially located and the other is not. And so Descartes, can, we, we can press this on his behalf to say, well, it can't possibly be that the mind is the brain for all of the neuroscientific evidence. The best that that shows you is some kind of correlation or causal relationship between the mind and the brain. It doesn't show you any identity. That's great. Thanks very much, Michael. Sally, anything you want to add to this bit of discussion? Yes, I think... What, what Michael said there is really important about properties and that links into the whole issue of a reductive project, which is what the identity theory is. And when you reduce something, you explain it for what it really is. And typically, like Michael said, we, we take examples from science. Water really is H2O, lightning really is electrical discharge. 
Clark Kent really is Superman and the Morning Star really is the Evening Star. Lots of examples like that. Now, they have to then, if you're going to do a reductive project, what you're reducing the entity to must have all the properties of what is being reduced. If they don't share properties, then like like Michael said, they they cannot have that identity. If um, Clark Kent has properties that Superman doesn't, even if he's hiding them, then no, he's, it's not one and the same thing. They're not one and the same thing. So if, if liquid H2O has properties that water doesn't, we've, we've not done a successful reductive project. So the question is then, if I'm saying that my mental state is my brain state, does my brain state incorporate all of the properties that a mental state is supposed to? And that's what the you know a general dualist argument against identity theory would deny. And one of the main problems for identity theory is qualia. And this idea that it's very difficult to explain qualia in, in physical terms. And there's lots of examples to, to illustrate this. But one that I really like is to imagine brain surgery. And some brain surgery is done with the patient fully conscious. So imagine that you are undergoing brain surgery and the surgeon has lifted up your skull, which is operating on your brain. We're both looking at, um, at my brain on a, on a screen. So we both have the same access to this physical thing, this brain. And actually, the surgeon has much better knowledge than I do. But imagine she's a, you know, a super neurosurgeon. She's a genius. And she knows every physical fact about my brain. And she's operating. And she, you know, those C fibers are firing away. And she's saying, you know, I can see you're in pain there. Don't worry about it. The fundamental question is, does she know what my pain is like for me? Now, if she doesn't, if there's something she can't access, despite all that physical knowledge, then there is something about my mental state that cannot be explained in physical terms, no matter how much neurological um, knowledge that you have. Because I think, and, and if that is the case, if you think there's something she can't access, then identity theory has to fail, as do all physical theories. Now, it's interesting because if identity theory was true, then we will eventually, if we had complete physical knowledge, be able to read minds. Because I, you know, a complete knowledge of brain state would be a complete knowledge of, of mental state. And, you know, again, if you think that's something that can't happen, you know, we could make a good guess. You know, a good neuroscientist could make a good guess, but we can't know. You can't know what that feels like for the person. And it's this qualia that's so sticky for physicalist theories, the phenomenological aspect of what it is like for me to feel that thing. And that is arguably inaccessible in, in, in physical terms. That's great. Really helpful. Can I then pause here and then just ask the three of you what you think overall of the of the position? What do you think its main flaws are? Where, where are you? What, what what's the evaluation we should be giving of uh, of uh, mind brain type identity theory? Mine is very much what I've just said in terms of you know yeah complete physical knowledge is going to give us a really good guess about what's going on in somebody's mind, but it will not close that gap, and the reductive project does fail. Short and sweet, Sally. Uh, Adrian, Michael, I'm mine. Mine is I. I also reject mind brain type identity theory. I think it's too simple as an account of of the relationship between the physical and the mental. Um, doesn't mean I necessarily reject physicalism, but I do think that if we're going to come up with a physicalist answer, it's going to have to be a more complicated one than than this one. And for me, I think it's sort of onto something. I've often struggled with it because it sounds almost crazy on the surface that you can say, you know, an experience in your head is, is um, some, some fact about your brain. But when you actually brought down into this approach, they seem to be saying that it's very much a process in your brain rather than an identity. So it's not like you've got an experience of red and then I don't know what red is, some firing in your brain. It rather seems to be that there's a process going on, a physical process, and you have to understand the experience of red as part of that process. And I think it's sort of, you can see where it's pointing towards, really. It's pointing in many ways towards, I think, eliminative materialism, where it's saying, actually, you've really got to radically rethink the concepts, the mental, as belonging to a process, a physical process. So I, I see it as very much sort of a harbinger for the eliminative materialism that is, 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 is pointing towards. Okay, that's great. Thanks, uh, all three of you, and particularly Adrian for that nice link uh, into the second half of this episode. So let's leave mind-brain type identity theory there, uh, and we'll see you in the next 
part for another dose of physicalism when we're going to be thinking about a limitative. And welcome back. Okay, so we've had uh, a big tour of philosophy of mind, focusing on physicalism. And in the first part of this episode, we've been thinking about mind-brain type identity theory and thought about the positive things to say about it, but also many of the issues. And that leads us on to another physicalist theory, a limitative materialism, which I have to say very carefully because otherwise all the syllables run together, or it's often called just a limitivism. Um, Sally, you're going to not run over all the syllables and explain it for us, aren't you? I will try. Um, yeah, so eliminative materialism is usually associated with Paul and Patricia Churchland, who are primarily neuroscientists, particularly Patricia Churchland has a, uh, a background in, in neuroscience. And her argument is that the time is now ripe for philosophy to be informed by neuroscience. And, and in that sense, it's got that in common with identity theory. You've got this um, strong neurological influence all these developments in neuroscience every single one seems to point to the idea that we're not we're not going to get minds without brains and yeah and this idea that it solves a lot of the problems with dualism as any physicalist theory would we have no problem of interaction because interaction is just physical things affecting other physical things we have no problem of other minds because there's no private in the mental world so you're coming from that same place as identity theory but there's some very important differences so Whereas identity theory is trying to do this reductive project to say that this is what mental states really are. So just as water really is H2O, my pains really are brain state X. For the, for the churchlands and, and for eliminative materialism, at least some of our folk psychological terms, and I'll come on to that in a moment, at least some of our talk about mental states needs to be eliminated. These things don't actually exist. Now, the specification has this nice little caveat, at least some. Uh, you know, the Churchlands are, are pointing towards all. You know, we know that. Uh, you know, these mental states are not there. So a really useful analogy with this is when we used to have folk physics. So folk physics was our ordinary, everyday way of explaining the physical world and, you know, largely wrong. So an example of folk physics would be the idea of sound particles, so we believe that the reason, you know, if I tap different things around me now, they would make different sounds is because they have different sound particles and these particles are released as I tap them. Now, we know this it explained the world nicely, you know, and I could make good predictive um, explanations for things and I could, you know, I could predict the world in a nice, coherent way, but it was wrong. Now, folk psychology, according to the Churchlands, is our ordinary, everyday way of predicting and explaining human behaviour in terms of things like beliefs, desires and so on. So if she desires to pass her exams, then she will start to revise. And I can predict the world in that way and it, it works. But their argument is that it's a hypothesis, just, just like any other hypothesis, and therefore it's open to be replaced. And now we have this neurological knowledge, it does need to be replaced. So the difference between, say, a reduction and an elimination can be illustrated with the example of, say, demons. So, you know, back in the day, we used to think that um, erratic behaviour was put down to demonic possession. And that's how we explained it. And then we exercised the demons and then people got better. And we had this whole way of explaining this, this behaviour. Now, we know that that was just wrong. Now, what we're not doing is saying, OK, so what are the demons really? We are eliminating them from our worldview. They don't belong there. Now, this is the difference between identity theory and eliminativism. We're not saying what are mental states really. We're saying they're not there. They're a mistaken way to explain the phenomenon that's going on. And, you know, that's a very radical theory. This is very difficult for us to get our heads around. So, hold on, I don't have beliefs. I don't have desires. And the churchmen are saying, well, no, there's a phenomenon going on. We're not denying that. But the way you're explaining it is wrong. These beliefs, desires, hopes, it might be useful, but it's actually, they're not there. And the more neurological evidence we get, the more this is, is backed up. And one example Patricia Churchland uses, it's a really good example, is the will. Now, we used to think there was this thing called the will, which is the reason that I'm going to do this action as opposed to that action. And the more experiments and more evidence that we get, it points towards that not being the case. There is no will. In fact, certain studies show that sometimes we, we think we've made a conscious decision, but actually 
the consciousness of that decision is happening after we've made after we've done the action yeah and then the, so the, the, the studies are, are suggesting that a lot of these mental states that we believed were the reason we did x y and z are just not there so yeah this really shook things up really interesting theory and it seems hugely radical at first but the more you delve into it there's actually some pretty good arguments for this it's not as as bonkers as it as it first seems okay that's great thanks sally and to continue the story thinking about um some arguments and ideas uh michael do you want to chip in here please yeah sure um one of the the kind of founding papers um, from the Churchlands on this presented three arguments. This was from Paul Churchland. Three arguments for thinking that we needed to really open our mind to the, the idea that the way in which we we conceive of of the mind normally, folk psychology, just needed needed to go. Um, and we can develop that with some further arguments from Patricia late, uh, Churchland later on. So Paul Churchland kind of identifies three issues. It depends on, as Sally has explained, the idea that thinking about the mind in terms of beliefs and desires and choices and so on is uh, is just an empirical theory. And so if it's just an empirical theory, then there are some things that we expect of empirical theories. And folk psychology doesn't demonstrate those successfully. So for a start, you want your theory to kind of cover the ground. You want it to be able to explain what's going on. That's what a, what a good theory does. And here he says folk psychology is really patchy. There's all kinds of things which are part of our mental lives, which folk psychology is awful at explaining. It can't explain mental illness. It can't explain intelligent, it's intelligence. It can't explain why we need to sleep. It can't explain how we learn things. That was his, his claim. And so this kind of is something which is very problematic, where your empirical theory is just kind of picking out little bits of the phenomena and saying, well, that's why this happens. But, you know, you don't exactly learn things just because you have beliefs and desires and you can, it, it doesn't really tell you how you take on and remember new forms of information and, and all of these kinds of things. So that's kind of a first problem. The second is that we expect over time, if you've got an empirical theory, that uh, you can learn more about the world. So, you know, with the scientific revolution, um, but even prior to that point, there's a fantastic history of scientific discovery and development. We learn more about planets. We learn more about plants. We learn more. Well, folk psychology is no more advanced now in terms of understanding human beings than the Greek authors who are writing about you know, tragedy in ancient Athens. They had a very good understanding of jealousy and power play and and all of this kind of stuff. And really, we've just made no significant progress in our understanding of people and the mental world of people for about 2,000 years. So it's really out of sync with the way in which our, our understanding of the world has generally developed. And that's kind of the, the sign that maybe something, all is not well. Um, in the land of folk psychology, if it's an empirical theory which doesn't really expand, develop, gain new evidence over time, then something may be problematic here. And the third thing that he said, and I think this is this is in some ways the most important thing, um, because it's about the concepts themselves, and that is that um, as as Adrian explained earlier in his account of the dualist arguments against mind brain type identity theory, the kind of fundamental way in which folk psychology understands the world involves concepts which which don't fit into the physical world at all. So you would have to really commit yourself to something entirely dualistic. And that's a really bad idea for an empirical theory, Churchland thinks as well. In particular, the notion of intentionality. You can take qualia there too. But the notion of intentionality just doesn't seem to fit with an emerging empirical theory about how the mind works, which is neuroscience. So as neuroscience kind of is really starting to able to explain intelligence or learning or the need for sleep or mental illness or the nature of choice and the will and all of these kinds of things, it's not using a fundamental idea of intentionality, this, this thought that thoughts ha- are about something. They have a sort of aboutness because 
the, the what's going on in your mind is a purely biological, biochemical process. Neurons release chemicals, with uptake across synaptic gaps by other neurons and so on. And there's a way in which it's much, much, much more complicated than digestion in certain ways, but it's still kind of like digestion. And you don't digest about your food. <laughs> That's grammatically wrong. It doesn't make any sense. You can just, you digest, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing about it. It's just a process. It's just a fact. It doesn't represent something in, at all. And so his argument is that this concept of intention and intentionality, rather, is going to have to give. It's just going to have to give because we absolutely cannot fit it in to the way that neuroscience is proceeding in its explanations of the world. So that, with that being eliminated, so does everything else, which is an intentional mental state. Emotions and beliefs and desires, our normal, our normal understanding of these things is going to have to give, give way. And so Patricia kind of points to other scientific revolutions, other moments in the history of science where we have eliminated something. And Sally's already given the example of demonic possession. But it, to think it's not just something about um, psychology. Uh, she gives a, an example from, from physics, from the physics of heat. So we used to you know, think scientists, this is not just folk physics, but scientists used to you know, question, what is heat and, and how does it transfer? And um, we still have a lot of terms from this archaic theory. For instance, the notion of a calorie, which is still the measurement of the energy held by a solid or liquid or gas, which chemists use. You can, you know, this is the number of calories it takes to heat a kilogram of water or whatever it is. And this comes from the theory that heat is caloric fluid. And it's this kind of fluid, very, very thin fluid that can literally pass, can flow between things. And unfortunately, it's not. Heat is not caloric fluid at all. It can't literally flow in solids and in liquids and in gases. That doesn't exhaust the ways heat is, but in those things, at least heat is to do with the vibration of molecules. And so they had to not just say, oh, what I meant by caloric fluid really is the vibration of molecules. No, you can't do that. You can't reduce it. You've got to say, no, I was wrong about caloric fluid. There's no such thing. And a series of experiments proved this to be the case. It would end up had to have a negative mass, which was very, oh no, that was, well, there were all kinds of problems with it. It used to be infinitely generatable. For example, if you rub your hands, you never run out of uh, releasing the caloric fluid, which is in them. So how much caloric fluid is in your hands? infinite amounts where you can't have an infinite amount of a fluid. There are all these kinds of experiments that people were able to do to sort of say, well, it, this is just wrong. And so it had to be eliminated in favor of the theory of molecular vibration. And that, for the Churchlands, is really the fate of some of the key understandings of folk psychology, in particular intentionality and qualia, these are going to have to be replaced because they cannot fit. And the scientific evidence seems to really be, they, for, on their reading of it, kind of breaking down our normal ways of thinking about thought and consciousness. And instead of going, well, we just need to kind of fiddle with the edges, we need, a, we need to brush the room free of this, of this mistaken conception of the world and, and just work with the concepts which are coming out of neuroscience. Thanks, Michael. That's really, really helpful and, uh, and clear. Adrian, you said you wanted to chip in at this point as well. Yes, I think Daniel Dennett uh, builds very much on this view of why eliminative materialism is the way to go. And he does this in his article of 1988, Quining Qualia. In this article, based on Quine, who's an important American philosopher, and he uses a similar approach. It's like an anti-metaphysical approach. You just say, actually, these questions are not real questions. They should be left behind. It goes really back to maybe Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, but mostly in the philosophical investigations. But in this article, he talks about qualia meant to be having four distinct characteristics. They're meant to be ineffable. Um, you can't really identify them, but you just directly experience them. And only then do you somehow bring them into language. They're meant to be intrinsic, unanalyzable. They're prior to explanation, and we just sort of recognize them. They're meant to be private in your own mind, and they're meant to be directly and immediately apprehensible. So in many ways, they're just meant to have them in your own mind, and you don't need 
in some sense, any mechanism by which to arrive at them. And he rehearses a number of arguments against them based on, in some sense, the experience of wine, inverted qualia, coffee, and beer. We can focus on the beer one, for example. In the beer one, he says, okay, when you first taste beer, um, it tastes bad. Then when you've got more of an acquired taste for it later on in life, it tastes good. And he says, okay, it does, are you tasting the same beer when you taste it later on in life as you tasted it before? And there seems to be really no way of deciding upon that. You could say, well, maybe the, the, the taste mechanisms um, of my mouth have all sort of led to a different experience of the brain now I've grown up, or maybe my brain just now has somehow matured or something, and therefore I like the taste of beer. And because there's this complete undecidability about the identity of the beer taste, whether it's the same taste and whether you now like the taste, but you didn't like the taste, or whether it's a different taste and now you didn't have that taste before and now you do have the taste, because there's this complete undecidability about what the qualia are, it's best to leave them behind, really, and go to a proper understanding of identification than, than qualia that seem to mean anything or nothing, depending upon how they're interpreted. I think in many ways this goes back to Ludwig Wittgenstein's own book in the Philosophical Investigations, where he talks about the private language argument, and he talks about a beetle in a box. And this beetle's sort of like a qualia or a mental idea that's meant to be purely subjective and private to you. And so I open up my box, I, I look into my own mind, and I identify it as a beetle. And I say, oh, I've got a beetle in my box. But Wittgenstein asks, well, what does that even mean, though, to say that it is a beetle rather than something else? Because Wittgenstein's made the linguistic turn, he's interested in how are conceptual distinctions possible? How is identification through language possible? And when you just say, well, you just immediately recognize it because it's in your own mind, it doesn't seem to take language and communication seriously. And so the very idea of a beetle becomes no different from the idea of nothing at all. Indeed, beetle seems to name everything and nothing. And if we're really going to understand identification, rather than appealing to these things, which we allegedly have in our own minds, we should rather look at the processes of communication, at the processes of, let's say, physical causation, in terms of which we arrive at the word beetle rather than some other word, such as rat or something. Um, so proper identification needs a proper process of identification and some appeal to, oh, well, I immediately know exactly what I'm talking about because it's in my own mind, seems to be inadequate, as, Dave, as was argued with the beer example. I think this has turned out to be a, a quite a powerful argument because although Daniel Dennett, I think, had the worst of the argument when it came to the John Searle's Chinese room argument, Searle would always argue back, well, you know, you can't really make sense of the Chinese room argument by just appealing to a machine that gets some Chinese input and then gives a Chinese output. We, we in some sense, have to experience the understanding ourselves. We can't just perform an algorithm on an input and then an output and then say that's all understanding is, that's all the mental process is. We have to actually understand Chinese, not just get an input and get an output. But I think in many ways now that artificial intelligence has moved on so much that there's almost a new game being played. Nowadays, the artificial intelligence people distinguish between what's called GoFi, which is good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, G-O-F-A-I, which is basically a computational theory of the mind where you do have an input, you have an algorithm, and then you have an output. So it's like a deterministic model, which is called serial processing, because you get a single input, and then you get a single output. And this sort of process seems to be incapable of really the complexity of understanding Chinese. But now that artificial understanding of the mental has been replaced by these artificial neural networks. And they seem, they seem to be much more organic in the way they make sense of the mental processes because they look at the neurons 
and they look at the dendrites, which is where all the input comes in, and they notice that the, the, the input is not just you know, one particular Chinese word, for example, coming in, and then you've got to act upon it and then give an output. There are rather multiple channels of communication coming in. You can see the nerve cell a bit like a tree, and you've got all these different roots with all, let's say, with the tree's got all this water coming in through so many different channels, and then it goes up through the body of the tree, the trunk, in with all these different outputs. The nerve cell is doing something similar. You've got multiple electronic channels coming through it. And these are all through the dendrites and multiple electronic channels going out of it through the axons. And it's through this real complexity that these processes occur. And it seems that rather than just a, you know, this is the right answer or this is the wrong answer, what is happening is we've got different weights being ascribed to each of these electronic channels coming in to the neurons. And there's not just an input and an output. The output itself loops back in what's called a back-propagated model. And so, for example, the, the neurons are almost looking for patterns. And um, it's not just input-output model. It's like if one of the feeds through the dendrites sort of helps to make sense of the pattern that I'm trying to establish, then it's strengthened. And that seems to confirm what I'm looking for and therefore a right understanding of it. Whereas if the input is a little bit crazy, it doesn't seem to confirm what you're looking for, that input can be silenced because it's not really helpful for establishing patterns. Now, if this is right, and that the neurons are in some sense pattern recognition, recognizing functions, then you could even say maybe identification is itself a result of pattern recognition. So for example, often when we we recognize someone, we think, oh, yeah, you know, I've recognized who he is, what he is, or something like that. We've, we've understood his essential nature. But let's say we take Prince Charles, for example. I mean, what does it mean to recognize Prince Charles? You could say, well, you've, you've recognized what he is. You've got some input, and now you've got the right output. But you could say, actually, I've gone behind identification. And it seems that nowadays in artificial intelligence, they almost establish a norm. This is something Hubert Dreyfus um, was looking into based on Heidegger's philosophy, interestingly. And he said, actually, what we do is you establish a norm. And then let's say for Prince Charles, you say, well, he's got slightly bigger ears than the norm, and maybe he wears a better suit than the norm. And based on those features, that's how identification happens, not through somehow having the identity of Prince Charles in your head. But by many ways, all of these patterns, they need to discriminate one person relative to another and, and saying, okay, that's Prince Charles. And in many ways, I think cartoonists actually develop this. They often say you can actually recognize someone easier through a cartoon than you can in real life. Why? Because they've accentuated the features that distinguish that person from the norm and therefore allow you to recognize them more clearly. And so if this is right, then often what we've got through artificial neural networks, which replaces GoFi, what we have through artificial neural networks is understanding that behind identification lie these patterns of recognition. And the patterns of recognition are really quite complex and overlaying. And we've got neural networks not only taking in patterns, but also looking for patterns because the axons are feeding back information, which either confirms or fails to confirm those patterns in this sort of loop almost of learning. And so the models of artificial intelligence we're even beginning to get now on computers, whereby with chat GPT, you can actually... Um, refine the output you're getting by, in some sense, feeding back, asking them to re refine, for example, the search you've put in. We're going behind just a strict, almost like the strict logic that maybe Descartes would have originally had. I, I have this identity in my mind. I know what it is. And then I infer something from it, such as, let's say, the external world exists because I know at least the thoughts in my own minds. But if this is right, and these artificial neural network system of understanding is right, the identities in my mind are not fundamental. They are, in some sense, almost the last part of a process, uh, a process of 
complex pattern recognitions that, for example, when they're put together in the right way, allow us to discriminate one thing from another. And that seduces us perhaps to think there are these fundamental identities in our head. But this just tempts us away from an understanding of the physical processes by which those patterns themselves were established. And so what we've got to adopt is what they're claiming is a parallel distributive process rather than a traditional serial processing, which was like deterministic and linear. You just get one input, a bit like the Chinese room thought experiment, one input, and then you give an output to it. We've got a very complex parallel sources of information in which we ascribe more weight or less weight to all these different inputs, depending upon what pattern we're looking for. And so we distribute the weight among us. And that seems to be we're moving then to a pre-symbolic understanding, where in many ways the symbols that we used to think were fundamental, these conscious identities we have, the symbols in some sense have to be gone behind. They've got to eliminate them to understand these pattern recognitions in terms of which we arrived at those symbols in the first place. Okay, thanks, Adrian. And thanks all, all three of you. So we built up a really, really strong, powerful, rich picture of limited materialism. Um, But I think, as uh, someone said, it's a very radical um, departure. So there are some arguments that people give against it. People are uneasy about it. So um, who wants to kick things off and uh, give us a few ideas uh, against it? I'm happy to start off with um, one of the issues that, I mean, it's basically the idea that this is just so obviously wrong. Um, And I think the way that it's, it's phrased is the intuitive certainty of mental states, of my own mental states, it just overrides any other consideration. So the idea that, you know, Descartes' first certainty was, was I think, and I've got these thoughts, who is to tell me that I don't, I'm not feeling this belief that I haven't got this fear, you know, that just the phenomenological experience just trumps everything. Now, firstly, I think we've got to be really careful about what is obvious, very dangerous to say something is obvious. If you, if you backtrack 400 years, then it was obvious that the Earth was the centre of the solar system. We watched the sun move around the sky. You know, we literally saw it with our own eyes. And now we know that sunrises are an illusion. There is no such thing as a sunrise. There is an, an Earth move. <laughs> so, you know, it, it just doesn't make any, any sense. So we need to be careful about the just saying that mental states are obvious. The second response also is that the the eliminative materialist is not saying you're not having a phenomenological experience. They're not saying that, you know, what is going on in your mind, you're not experiencing it. It's the way you're explaining it is false. So when we eliminated sound particles, we didn't eliminate sound. You know, sound still existed, but our method of explaining it was wrong. And the components of that method of explaining it had to go. So that's what the that's what the Churchlands are saying. They're not saying that you're not having a particular phenomenological experience. You're just wrong that it's free will, belief, thoughts, hopes, and desires, and that's what what needs to go. So that's you know probably the the first criticism that most people come up with, um, along with the idea that it just it it seems to lack what it means to be human. We you know it's a very difficult you know, idea to get our heads around that we don't have beliefs and thoughts and desires and hopes. Now, surely that's what makes us what we are. That's the richness of, of, of human life. Yes and no. I mean, if you, it, the Churchlands would probably suggest, particularly Patricia Churchland, that actually we'll end up treating people better if we eliminate mental states, particularly something like the free will. Now, imagine if that was eliminated, how differently we would, we would treat people. And, and Patricia Churchland herself gives an example of when she she was operating on a patient who'd been having paedophilic thoughts, never acted on them, but the thoughts were there. And she found a tumour in his brain and she removed the tumour and the thoughts went. Yeah, and then when he came back, he said, look, these thoughts are coming back. Lo and behold, you look in, the tumour's coming back again. So the idea of just looking, changing how we perceive human beings doesn't necessarily have to mean devaluing them, which I think is a quite an intuitive response to this very radical theory. That's great. Thanks, Sally. Michael, Adrian, any thoughts? Yeah. Against? I'll pick up, if I may, kind of pick up two, two, kind of two points together. So the reason I'm kind of doing this is because the way in which the, there's a kind of sense of the progress of neuroscience, that the, the church has said, look, the time has come that we're going to need to eliminate these. 
because you know folk psychology hasn't made any progress and and these basic ideas of intentionality and consciousness and beliefs and desires really don't have any future and one response is to say give really good sort of empirical reason to think that they do that if we have a look at developments within psychology, for instance, within cognitive psychology, we can find that folk psychological concepts like beliefs and desires and so on are absolutely fundamental to those sorts of explanations of the mind. And in fact, the way in which neuroscience is proceeding is by trying to find connections between neuroscience and cognitive psychology to give us the branch of the last kind of 20 years called cognitive neuroscience which uses this notion of thoughts and beliefs and the manipulation of memories and all of these kinds of things which we can recognize folks psychologically to investigate the operations of the brain, to categorize them, to identify them, and so on. So we could say, well, hang on, folk psychology isn't dead yet. Yes, okay, it didn't make this kind of progress over two and a half thousand years, but actually over the last 150 or 200 years, we really have started to make some progress. And there's reason to think that it's starting to integrate with neuroscience. That's kind of one way that you can try and say, well, your, your forecast of doom is, is unsupported. But of course, you know, one, one might be wrong about this. Cassandra, after all, was not listened to and she turned out right in the end. But everyone went, oh, no, it's just Cassandra. So, I mean, it may well be that in the current place, and this is what the churchmans would say, yes, and before we get a full account of human psychology, we've got to use the tools and ways of thinking that we've currently got. What we're saying is in the end, you're going to have to get rid of folk psychology. So you can't, in the end, really integrate the two. And that brings us to the, to the second point, which is why I'm taking the two together. Why can't you integrate the two? Why can't you have genuinely successful cognitive neuroscience at the end of the day? Well, because of this concept of intentionality. You just can't have a brain process which is about something. But that leads to, um, to this, this other um, objection, which is that if that were true, I, you wouldn't actually be able to say it's true. Because to say, to present your theory of eliminative materialism, you want to make a claim. And you want to make a claim which, as we understand, expresses a belief. So we want to say, well, the Churchlands believe that you know eliminative materialism is true. Well, that's problematic because if the Churchlands are right, they don't. Right? So <laughs> it seems to be self-refuting that if 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 there's no such things as beliefs, how can you assert the theory itself? And if there's no such things as beliefs, how can you have arguments and reasoning and evidence and all of these kind of logical links that we have between things? You know, reasoning works by taking this claim which we believe and inferring these other claims from it so that we believe them as well. And this is kind of all based on this idea of intentionality that we're able to think about the world, we're able to think about the brain, we're able to find evidence for um, uh, these claims and not these claims. So that's kind of the, the, the charge, which is, again, you know, we've got to in eliminate intentionality. And the, the, the charge is, well, that's just absurd because it's self-refuting. Because to eliminate intentionality is to eliminate the meaningfulness of thoughts, the idea that thoughts are about things. But that's precisely what a theory itself is. It's a thought about something. So you have to kind of say, well, we don't have any theories either, which is then the problem. I'll let somebody else explain the response there, I think. But that's the kind of, that's the charge and one response and then a second charge that the intentionality isn't up for grabs. I suppose another way you might put it is it simply defines the field. That's, it's not something which can be eliminated in favor of some alternative theory. Thanks, Michael. Anyone want to pick up the story? Any other thoughts and points? I mean, I do think that, that this idea of intentionality is really important because the limited materialist charges, well, look, we can't fit intentionality into our physicalist worldview. Mental states, by necessity, include intentionality. They're always about something. Therefore, mental states don't exist. Well, why don't we flip that? Intentionality is a fact. So if you can't fit it into the physicalist worldview, then the physicalist worldview is wrong. You know, they, you don't have to eliminate intentionality. You can eliminate physicalism. But um, I think, you know, certainly this kind of, Idea, like just picking up on what Michael says, the idea that folk psychology has had its day. There's things that neuroscience can't explain yet, you know, which folk psychology can. You know, I come home and I've had a horrible day and I decide, well, am I going to binge watch Peaky Blinders or read a book, you know, and I'll make a decision. And 
neuroscience is going to struggle with that, whereas folk psychology would would be better at it. So yeah, again, it, it's not to be dismissed so easily. Thanks, Sally. Adrian, you wanted to come in. Yeah, <clears throat> if you come back maybe to the very introduction to the program where we distinguish in the ontological and the epistemological and the normative questions. I mean, what sort of eliminativism is involved here exactly? This could be an ontological eliminativism or maybe the normative explanatory eliminativism. You can see these with specific examples. For example, with medicine in the medieval age, they used to understand health and illness in terms of the four humours, which were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And in many ways, these four humours had to be in balance if you were to be healthy. And so if they would do really quite sophisticated, complex analyses of health in terms of these concepts of the humours. And nowadays, sort of being completely replaced, eliminated. We don't even think there are these four humours at all. And now with the development of Louis Pasteur and, and other people coming up with the pasteurization of milk, actually, you start believing in these pathogens like bacteria or viruses. These caused the illness, and it was nothing to do with some balance of alleged humours. So there, there's been an ontological elimination of the humours as not referring to anything in favour of pathogens as the actual causes of illness, these invisible beings that are in some sense inside us, like like the virus or whatever else it is, that's the real cause of illness, not the balance of humours. So that is the ontological elimination. But you could have just an explanatory elimination as well. For example, in the case of the atom, the atom was traditionally seen as a completely indivisible element. Indeed, that was literally what it means in, in ancient Greek. But then as physics developed, uh, the atom no longer was understood to be that explanatory, play that explanatory role. It was rather itself composed of more basic things, such as a nucleus with protons and neutrons and these electrons and shells around it. Indeed, we've even gone beyond that to quarks. And so the atom has in many ways been gone beyond and it's been eliminated as some sort of explanatory indivisible element. But that's not to say that we completely reject the language of the atom in physics anymore, or even in chemistry. We still sort of hold on to it, um, but we no longer see it to play a fundamental explanatory role. So it's eliminated as an indivisible element and it's come to play a sort of a different role. And I think it's important when we deal with eliminative physicalism or materialism to, to say exactly what sort of elimination is involved here. Is it an ontological elimination of the mental, such as the four humours um, in medicine, or is it an explanatory elimination, um, such as we had of the atom playing this indivisible fundamental role? But that being said, um, it's difficult to clarify which would be of it. I would be of the opinion that the explanatory elimination is probably the more promising route for um, elimination to go down, eliminativism to go down. Um, rather than doing an ontological elimination, this seems to be extreme and completely deny consciousness seems probably to be an, a, not a very promising way to go. But at the same time, some of their arguments that what we take to be conscious identities in our own mind, they do seem to be suspect. Um, and we've got a, a number of sort of experiments even to show that to be true. I think Nisbet and de Camp came out with labels of taste. Now, you would have thought with Descartes, well, I know, I think what, therefore I am. I know my own experiences better than anybody else. There's this subjective immediacy to it. But when they um, gave people some Parmesan cheese and they labeled it as Parmesan cheese, they thought, oh, this was a nice taste. Whereas when they labeled it as vomit, then they thought it was a nasty taste. So it seems as though we might not actually be um, the ultimate authorities on our own experiences, because in many ways, what we experience is so much shaped by the environment and the context within which we experience it. And again, Dennett has come out with similar things. Um, he's said that when you put a playing card 
um, in your peripheral vision. So it's almost just to the side. You can't see it directly, but it's to the side. You can't actually see its color. But then we've got this weird sort of experience where we say we've got an experience, but I don't know what its color is. Um, but you'd have thought, surely, but they can't. You are the ultimate authority on what the experience is. You know whether it's color. You know what color it is because it's your experience. But it's only when the card is moved closer to our fovea, to this the, the focal point in our vision, that we actually come to recognize, ah, oh, that's the color of the card. I wasn't sure. But you'd have thought, how can you not be sure about your own experience when you are meant to be the ultimate authority on it? And he's also come out with the ex- sort of interesting example of people who've experienced morphine saying that they've actually had pain that's pleasant. And you thought, well, surely, you know, introspection shows that that's a plain contradiction. You can't have a pleasant pain. But it seems though, as long as the right input's coming in, um, uh, let's say the morphine and yet other experiences of pain, we can experience things that, that seem to even defy our own logic. And so the explanatory reduction, um, the explanatory elimination of consciousness playing a fundamental role, at least to me, seems to be quite compelling. And also what I was talking about earlier with artificial neural networks, it seems that we, we sometimes can go behind the identities that we experience to, to find the patterns of neural networks upon which those identities depend But at the same time, an ontological elimination seems to be um, too extreme. I think we have to take the experience of consciousness itself seriously. But whether we see it to play a fundamental role like the atom does seems to me just inappropriate. I think we have to to take the elimination of at least playing any role like that quite seriously. Thanks, Adrian. The way that started us off on the the last question I was going to ask. So I think we know what what Adrian's view is. Michael, Sally, any thoughts from you about what you think about eliminative materialism? For me, it's one of these things that, to start with, I'd probably agree that it just seems obviously wrong that we, you know, we can eliminate beliefs and desires. And then I find I teach it in class, and by the end of teaching it, I'm like, okay, that's a really convincing argument that I don't actually want to believe, but that's a decent essay in support of eliminative materialism. Um, so I, I, it's a really tricky one. And I think, again, as, I, as I've said before, it boils down to qualia and any any theory of mind is going to have to deal with qualia so this again this phenomenological aspect this what it is like for me what are you going to do with it now you can say it doesn't exist which would be very helpful to eliminativism and it's what Dennett does it's a confused concept you know we can't really define it anyway you can say it's physical or you can say it can't be explained physically and therefore physicalism fails and I lean towards that latter one uh, but then obviously your problem is what theory are you going to have if it's not physicalist but I think, for me, I think we have to acknowledge certain facts about consciousness. And, you know, and one of them is qualia. And that might be enough to, to discount some theories, even if you don't have the perfect theory. So just because we haven't necessarily made dualism work doesn't mean we can then adopt physicalism. If physicalism doesn't work either, we're still searching. And when you, you, you've got certain parts of a jigsaw that you need to put together... If you can't make it fit, you don't just chop bits off the jigsaw pieces. You keep working. And I think that's where we are, really, because I don't think we have, this just sounds such a cop out, we don't have a convincing theory of mind. Um, and I don't think eliminativism is it, to be honest. Thanks, Sally. Michael? I'm kind of glad Sally went first there, because I was trying to think how to say what some things which are very similar to what she's just said. So <laughs> she's just said them. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I, I I am pulled by these different, you know, different elements. I I do think that the the experimental evidence that Adrian was talking about is is fascinating. That you know, it, consciousness isn't quite what we thought that it was, but that doesn't mean it isn't anything. Intentionality in the way that intentional mental states or what we think of as beliefs and desires that's also highly problematic. Um, the way in which we think that these things operate in terms of our choices and our behavior and our and our logical thinking there's a lot of scientific evidence that things are not quite the way that we have thought that they are and i find that persuasive but that doesn't get me to a stage of saying so i need to have a complete conceptual spring clean at this point it leads me to a point of thinking well on the one hand you know we have these phenomena and we need an explanation on the other hand there's no way we're going to get it from there 
and that's sort of really where I'm where I'm at as as well. I think we do have to be careful not to commit too many category errors. I do think that you know Ryle was onto something that the substantiation of the mind, the idea of the mind as a thing or mental properties as things, is highly problematic. And I think we need to be really careful about that. But I don't know how to pull together the different strands, which I find persuasive in the different theories that we look at. That's great. Thanks, Michael. I think that's a good note on which to end things. Uh, We should say thank you to all of our guests for all their thoughts and energy. So Sally, thanks very much for coming on today. Thank you, Simon. It's always a pleasure. Uh, And Adrian, thanks to you as well. Thanks. I've loved it. Uh, Finally, thanks to you, Michael. And thanks very much, Simon. Cheers. And thanks to you for listening. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, I hope you check out some other episodes on Philosophy Gets Schooled.